Let's turn to Matthew chapter number six. Matthew chapter number six. And uh, we're going to start uh, reading the word in a second here. We're in a series called Ancient Practices for Modern Problems. Ancient Practices for Modern Problems. And uh, this series has been a blessing to me because as we go through each one of these practices, what I learn is what you practice becomes a discipline. And your discipline becomes your lifestyle. What you practice becomes a discipline, and your discipline becomes your lifestyle. And so when we've been practicing Sabbath, and last week we learned that success is a practice. I hope that you all took that home and understand that success is not just something that has resulted in my life, but success is actually a practice that I have to begin to create a discipline of. And it is not the success that we think. As a matter of fact, this, this message right here will kind of clear that up. Uh, that it is not the success that we think it is the biblical success that God has us after so who are we associating with what are we meditating on and are we allowing God to present us before the people that he wants to present us as successful in front of this week I want to talk about the discipline and practice of simplicity the discipline and practice of simplicity as we think about this word simplicity, I want to read to you Matthew chapter 25, I mean Matthew chapter 6 rather, verses 25 through 33. Here's what it says. It says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. This modern problem of anxiety that is plaguing our life, Jesus in the Bible says to us several times, do not be anxious. It is actually what in the Greek is called an imperative. It is a command. It is not a suggestion, nor is it something that he has given to us as a thing to be uh, considered. He's saying this is a command. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them and you are you not of more value than they and which of you being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan one translation says can add a single cubit to his height and why are you anxious about clothing consider the lilies of the field how they grow they neither toil nor spin yet I tell you even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these but of God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. But seek first, somebody say first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will, somebody say will, will. be added to you. Today we're going to talk about the discipline of simplicity. As I read this text, it, may, it reminded me that we live in a world where people are living in extremes. People live in extremes. They're, they're extremes. I'm an extreme type person. I live in extremes. I'm an extreme person. When I, when I go after something, I'm extremely passionate about it, and I do it, and I give it everything that I have. And when I'm against something, I'm vehemently against it. I'm almost violently against the things that I'm opposed to. I'm an extreme person. We, we see that in life all around us. In politics, we see people who live in extreme places. You, you got Republicans who are so extremely Republican that if you use the letter D in a sentence, they will get nauseous. They, they, are, so, they are so Republican that you can't say the letter D because it sounds like Democrat. You can't say the letter L because it sounds like liberal. Some people are so Republican that those things make them nauseous. You got some people who are so Democrat that if they got stopped at a red light, they see the, 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 the red and the red light and it represents Republican, they shouting at the red light, talking about the man is always trying to stop me. Some people are so Democratic that they can't, can't even stop at a red light. You got others in a serious, on a serious note, who are extreme about their faith. They, they believe something so much so that they will, they will take their faith to an extreme level, to a level in which they harm other people. 
because of their faith. We, we've seen people in our recent uh, history that, that believe that killing other people and themselves is a sign and an act of faith toward their God. But we as Christians can, can, can uh, eliminate our thought process on this because in Christian history, there has been what is called the Crusades where Christians took their faith to an extreme level to where when Christians felt like they needed to share the gospel, they felt the extremity of their faith and the pleasure of their God was to kill other people who didn't believe what they believed. People are extremists. They, they take extreme measures to say what they believe or what it is that they're after. Now, now, on a lighter note, there, there's extremes in sports. There is a team locally that will play football either today or sometime this weekend. And you either really, really love them. I'm talking about the Cowboys now. And everybody's on pins and needles because they don't know what I'm going to say. And the truth of the matter is you either love the Cowboys. I mean, you love them with all that you have. Or you are like me and you hate the Cowboys. You, you love them so much that you're extreme in your view and it blocks all of your reason and rationality. And you think that every year is the year. You think that this is the year they're gonna go to Super Bowl. Or you hate them so much that even when they're good, you try to find a way to talk about how garbage they are. We live in a world of extremes. Even in, even in music, we live in this world of extremes. I remember growing up on the West Coast and, and the rap battles then were, were between the East Coast and the West Coast. And if you grew up in California, you, you did not listen to the East Coast rap. You loved your Snoop Dogg. You loved your Dog Pound. You loved your Ice Cube, West Side Connection, Mac 10. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Uh, you loved it, and, and, but I was, I was, my brothers and I, we were Biggie fans. We loved Biggie, and, and the problem is when you're growing up on the West Coast, you can't like Biggie because everybody's an extremist. And so what happens is because I live on the West Coast, everybody had to like Tupac, and one day we're in the 100 building of Long Beach Poly High School, and we're having an argument with one of our best friends because he thought that Tupac was better than Biggie, and it almost got violent. Because people are extremists, and we, we, we make extreme decisions. That, that rap battle thing has not died, no. Because today, in our day, you, you have the rap battles that continue to go, and you have to choose sides because you're an extremist. You either like Drake, or you like Pusha T. You like Drake, or you like Meek Mill. Common theme here. You like Drake, or you like Chris Brown. You like Drake, or you like Kendrick, what is wrong with Drake? Why is he beefing with everybody? <laughs> Either Drake has a lot of haters or something's wrong with Drake. Drake maybe needs to look in the mirror. Anyway, there are many extremists. And you have to take sides. We often find ourselves taking sides and that side, when we take sides, it helps, help, causes us to lose our balance, lose our focus. The, the, the biggest debate of extremity that happens, this is the one that divides everything. It'll divide this room, it'll divide marriages, it'll divide, it'll divide people inside of themselves because they can't decide and they want to be on one extreme or the other and there is no balance. This, 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 debate, this debate is one that's gone around the world and people argue about it everywhere they go and as soon as I say it, you're going to know exactly what I mean. It's going to flip you out. The greatest debate of extremes Grits, sugar, or salt? How many, how many sugar people in the house? Sugar, sugar people. You like sugar on your grits. You got the sweet tooth. How many salt people in the house? You like salt on your grits. This service, not as balanced as the other. It was about 50-50 in the first service. But in this, in this particular thing, even marriages are oftentimes divided over the grits debate. Salt or sugar? Salt will even, I mean, sugar will even cause a man like Tony who loves him, himself some people and he's a very balanced guy, but he's going to take his stance extremely on sugar. Because we live in a world of extremes. In this particular text, in Matthew chapter number six, Jesus is arguing against extremes. He's, he's arguing against extremes. You, you, you don't see it in the text, but I pray that by the time I get done, you'll understand what the extremes are here, what he's arguing against. He's arguing against the extremes that we tend to lean on on either side of the argument as it relates to how we deal with material wealth. And there are two extremes that we find ourselves in, two extremes that we find ourselves dealing with. The one extreme is the extreme of greed. 
The one extreme is the extreme of greed. And greed is when we desire something so much that we skip over our needs and we desire and pursue our wants even at the expense of anyone that's standing in our way. I'm going to say it again. That when we're greedy, we, we look over our needs and we desire and pursue our wants, even at the expense of those that are standing in our way. Don't stand in my way if I'm greedy. I'll step on your neck. Don't, don't, don't stand in my way if I want something. I will do it. I will get it, even at the cost of my own self. People are dying because of their own greed. People are addicted because of their greed. People are, people are, people are out of control because of their greed. One extreme is greed. And many times we preach about greed in our churches as it relates to money and other things. But there's another extreme as it relates to material things that Jesus, I believe, is preaching against in this particular text. And I want us to be reminded of it because it's easy for me to get up here and talk about greed. And you'll say, yep, I know about that, Pastor. But there are others of us who have this other extreme that we never hear about. It's called asceticism. And asceticism is simply a rigorous depriving of oneself and a denial of all pleasure, especially for religious reasons. It's when we say, we say, I can't have any pleasure in life. I can't, I can't enjoy anything in this world because I'm an aesthetic and I, I want to prove to the world that I am, am God's type of person. There is no wealth, there is no material good, and all of that stuff is evil, I'm turning it away. God says you need to fight against both of those extremes and the way to fight against both of those extremes is to live a life of simply simplicity. Simplicity. Here, here's what I need you to understand, that it is in simplicity that we have freedom against the extremes of greed and asceticism. Greed causes me to want too much. Greed causes me to pursue things at my own risk and at the risk of others. It's not simple. It makes it complicated. Asceticism makes it complicated in the sense that every time I'm blessed, every time something comes my way, I have to figure out how to dump it when maybe God called me to keep it. When we're following along on either of these two extremes, we're not living a simple, simple, simple life. We're living a Facebook status life. It's complicated. We got the life of a Facebook status. And God did not call us to live complicated lives. God called us to live simple lives. Now, I know we don't like the word simple because when you say someone is simple, you're basically saying they're dumb. Oh, don't try to play it off now. You know what I'm talking about. When you say that someone is simple, you're basically looking at that person as though they have a lower level of intelligence, although they have a lower level. And what we've done is we've transferred that into our wants, needs, and desires. And instead of living the simple life that God has called us to, the uncomplicated life free of anxiety and worry, what we have done is we have complicated life with our greed and our asceticism, and we have made life difficult for ourselves. Here's the reality. Life is not easy, but it should be simple. Life is not easy, but it should be simple. You're going to follow Jesus, there's going to be trouble. But there's a simple path to follow to get it done. So I want to give you three things, three things, and then three applications on what simple looks like in this particular text. What simple looks like in this particular text. The first thing that we see in the text is a simple life. A simple life. And as I just said, many of us don't want to go on the journey of having a simple life because we think simple is dumbed down. We think simple is non-intelligent. We think simple is too basic. And nobody wants to be basic. Nobody wants, to be, nobody wants to be basic. We think simple is just basic, but here's the thing that we've missed. What we have done is created complications trying to live a life that God has never called us to live. We, we are trying to be someone that we are not. We're trying to chase people that God has never called us to be like or to pursue. And here's the problem. It is complicated to try to live in someone else's reality when God has called you to a life of freedom and you're, as yourself. Let me say it again. It, it, is, it is difficult to live a life of complication trying to be someone else when God has called you to live a life of freedom as yourself. And here's the problem. It is, e it is simple to be me. Now, it's not easy. I don't want you to walk away from here and say, Pastor told me life was going to be easy. Life is not going to be easy, but it is simple. The Bible gives us these ancient practices for modern problems, and all of them are really simple. I preached on it. The reason why I'm using words like Sabbath and success and simplicity is because this this stuff is really basic. Go to sleep. Get a, good, get a good set of friends and read your Bible. Stop wanting too much. Like it's really simple stuff. 
But if I, if, I, if I give it to you in certain words, like asceticism and all of these things, baby, you get it. And I want you to understand, it's not complicated. It's really simple. And the anxieties that we have piled upon ourselves are not because God has forgotten about us. Not because God doesn't love us. Not because he doesn't have a hope or a future for us as he promised in his word. It is because we have made it complicated when it's really simple. And he says in the text that we are to live a simple, first things first, simple life. That God has called us to a simple life. If you know anything about Maslow's hierarchy of need, here's what he says. It's at the base of the hierarchy of needs. It is physiological need. That is food, water, breath, sleep, the ability to have a, a, a secure environment. Physiological needs are at the base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow, thank you for reminding me of what Jesus already said. Look at the text. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 20 through 27 says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food. And the body more than clothing, Jesus is not saying that those things don't consist of life. But he's saying those are the basic necessities of life. Now, I need you to understand something. He's saying that there is a basic foundation of the things that you need in life. But watch what he says in verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Read that again. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Missed it. He says, you're called to live a simple life. That simple life is a simple life of trust that God will provide for all of your basic needs. At the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is self-actualization, it's moral uh, ability, it's values, it's purpose, it's destiny, it's all of these things that we've been trying to teach, but because we live this complicated life on the bottom, worried about where we're going to eat, worried about where we're going to live, worried about all of these things, we can never get to the top and live fulfilled in our purpose and our destiny. You know you've made the most immoral decisions in your life, worried about your basic needs. Worried about your basic needs, your physical needs. I gotta meet my physical need. I gotta meet this physical need. I've gotta do it. And what happens then is I make a bad decision. I can't even live on the level God has called me to because I'm so worried and complicating what He's given me on the base level. So here's what He says. Here's what He says. Stop worrying about it. Here's what He says. Watch the birds. He says they don't sow, nor do they reap, nor do they harvest. Notice this. He said, they don't sow, they don't reap, nor do they harvest. He said, but your father feeds them. That's what the text is saying. He says, he's given you the ability to reproduce what you're worried about, and yet you're still worried. He said, you can sow seed into the ground, and it will bring about a plant that will produce food for you to eat, and yet you're still worried. The birds don't sow. The birds don't reap. The birds don't harvest and store up and save what it is that they gather. But yet you are worried and your father feeds them. Notice what he says. I've given you the ability, watch this, to work, earn, and save. And you're worried about what's coming next. He says, and I'm not even talking about your level of ability of work, the salary that you're making. He's saying, I'm giving you that ability and you're worried. He said, the birds don't even have that ability. And they're not worried. You know why? Because they know your father will provide for them. You missed that. They know that your father will provide for them. It's not even their daddy and they know he's going to provide. They're the creation and they understand that the creator will take care of them. How much more should we, the children, understand that the father will take care of us? He's called you to live a simple life. A simple life is a simple life of trust. And if you get to the point where you begin to truly trust God, here's what happens. The anxiety levels go down because the simplicity of life says that I will trust him for everything that I need in my life. Here's, here's what I need you to see. The text says this. The text says that the birds of the air, they don't sow or they don't reap. Job got this. When Job started talking to God about his problems and his issues, here's what happens. God starts talking back to Job. And in chapter 38, he said, brace yourself like a man, Job. Let's have a real conversation. 
I like God. God is confrontational. He's like, let's talk, Job. Let's talk man to man. You want to talk? He gets down to verse 41. And he said, who provides the raven its prey? When its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for a lack of food. He says, the, the ravens go out and they hunt and they pray for things. But watch this. The ravens don't even supply. Their, they're working, but they're not supplying for themselves. I'm even giving them the things they're hunting. The ravens are not even worried. Is there going to be enough stuff out there for us to go hunt from? Nope. They understand that your father will provide for them. Why are you so worried? Why are you so worried? Your father, the Bible says, owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And yet you're worried about where your next meal is coming from. Psalm 37 and 25. In the beginning, we hear that David says in verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. If you get down to verse 25, what does that look like? He says, I have been young and now I'm old. I love this because as young people, we spend so much time worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow that when we get old, we look back on our lives and say, God really did provide, but we didn't enjoy any of that provision because we were so worried about tomorrow. I I'm looking for a group of people who will say, in these years, I will begin to daily be grateful for what it is that God is providing so that when I look back on my life, it will be a testimony and not a regret service. He says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging for bread. They live a simple life, a simple life of provision, a simple life of trust. Second Peter chapter one and verse three. Here's what it says. His divine power has granted to us all things. Somebody say all things, all things. that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. The Bible says that everything you need for life, he's given it to you through his divine power. Says you don't have to lack or want for anything. God has already provided it for you. Can I get you to understand this? He says, stop worrying about your life. And he used the basic things of life, like food and drink. Because if you don't have food and drink and air, you'll die. I told you, it's just simple. It's just real simple. You don't have food, drink, or air, you'll die. And he says, you're worried about those things, but you don't understand. You never provided it for yourself anyway. God is the one who always gave us drink. God is the one who always gave us water. God is the one who always gave us food. God is the one who always gave us air. He says that you are worried about the wrong things. Here's what I, I realized this week. My kids have never, it has never dawned on them that they could die of starvation. It has never dawned on my children that they could die of salvation. You know why? They're spoiled. Oh, that's the truth. This week, I get in the car, I start talking to my kids. We're talking about going to the book fair. They tell me that they want a certain amount of money. I tell them what I'm going to give them, and it's less than what they asked for. But they start complaining about it. You know why? Because they're spoiled. You know why? Because they understand that if I have a need, daddy's going to meet my need. And on the end of need, when daddy meets all my needs, it leads to one of the extremes, greed. And so they became greedy in that moment. But here's what I tell you. Here's what you have to do. You have to first learn to live in the baseline of simplicity and say, this is the simple life God will provide for me like my father provides for me. My kids, they understand. I'm not going to let them go hungry. They don't even know what it feels. I don't even think they've ever really been hungry. <laughs> I don't even think they've ever really been hungry. And the reality is because they live this simple life of trust and receive trust and receive. They live a simple life of trust and receive. Can I tell you that what you think you're going through, you ain't even really hungry. You gotta live this simple life of trust and receive. Trust and receive. It's a simple life, which leads to point number two. You need to have simple style. Oh, this is gonna be good. Watch this. Look at what it says in verse 27. And which of you being anxious can add a single hour to this lifespan? That's that. Then, then number 28 says, and why are you anxious about your clothing. Greek construction is, and your clothing. What about it? He says, and your clothing. What, what are you wearing? What have you put on? I've been studying recently about successful people, and I was thinking about uh, the successes of men like Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. And, and there's something to be said about what they do. Th there, there's something to be said. You read these articles, there's an article in Forbes that talks about what they do. Zuckerberg decided several years ago that he would go out and he would buy a bunch of gray t-shirts and the same zip-up hoodie so that he could wear every day. Like he bought the same shirt over and over and over again, he would wear the same shirt and the same zip-up hoodie everywhere he goes. Steve Jobs did the same thing. He had the same black turtleneck. Y'all remember, it seemed like he was introducing the iPhone 17 different times because he had the same outfit on. 
He was like, and this is revolutionary. Your outfit ain't. <laughs> same black turtleneck with the same stonewashed jeans. He would come out every time. You know why? They said that many of them, uh, it, was, it was thought before that they didn't want to suffer from decision fatigue. That they believe that there is only a certain amount of the good decisions that can be made in a day. And so if I waste my time trying to figure out what it is that I'm going to wear, if I got a uniform, I can go in and I can save that decision for later. So it's been, it's been thought that. I read an article over it in Forbes that said that the psychologists have argued there was no such thing as decision fatigue. That really what it boils down to is that these CEOs, watch this, have decided that they need a little more control in their lives over something. And so what happens is the uncertainty of business, the uncertainty of the market, the uncertainty of what's happening around them has created an atmosphere where the simplicity of their wardrobe allows them to have a little more control over their atmosphere. The, the, the simplicity of their wardrobe gives them a little more control over their atmosphere. So what they're doing is, they, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So they have a little more control in this area. They feel like they have an opportunity to make better decisions. And so they make better decisions. That they, they, they make better decisions because what they thought was, if I don't have to make this decision and I can control that outcome, I can control other outcomes. We are not preaching today simplicity for control's sake, but I am saying that many of us have lost control of our atmospheres because we're looking outside of what God's will is for our lives to figure out what we're going to wear, what we're going to drive, where we're going to live, who we're going to be neighbors with, what school district are we going to be in. And I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm saying they're not primary. Ooh, this one is tight, but it's right. The reality is you got to watch and have simple style. Why is it that you are worried more about what you're putting on your external body than what's going on on the inside of you? I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you that you ought to be an ascetic. Because God has given you the ability to, to get wealth. Matter of fact, Proverbs 22 says, The blessings of the Lord maketh one rich and addeth no sorrow to it. And the word rich means to have an accumulation of things, wealth. So he is not anti-wealth. As a matter of fact, if I show you the text, watch what it says. It says, why are you worried or anxious about your clothing? The problem is not what you wear, it's that you're so concerned about it. The problem is not what you have, it's, so, it's that you're so concerned about it. The problem is not what you drive, it's that you're so concerned about it. It's that when you pull up next to somebody with a car that may cost more than yours, you're so concerned about it. Your identity is in your things, not in Jesus. You need a simple style. That simple style, though, is relative to what God has blessed you with. Oh, y'all don't want to hear it. Okay. Here it is. He says this. Watch the text. He says, why are you anxious about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Again, he says there is a human attribute that they don't have. But watch what God does. But yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He said they don't, they don't toil or spin. But Solomon, who in 1 Kings chapter number 10, when the Bible says the queen of Sheba comes to see Solomon, the Bible says that she was so impressed by even the uniforms that the people wore. that Solomon and them was wearing excellent clothes. So the Bible's not saying, don't wear excellent clothes. Don't you come in here looking like a bum next week. <laughs> Talk about pastor this simple style, man. I just wear my cut-up shorts and my tank top. Stop. Put some, cover, them, cover them arms up. Here, here's the reality. Solomon was not arrayed like one of these lilies. What he's saying is Solomon was adorned in great gear. Jesus, they, Jesus had such great clothes that they gambled over him at the cross. Ain't nobody telling you not to look nice. I'm not telling you not to get yourself together. Stop worrying about it, though. Stop worrying about what you're going to wear. Stop worrying about the type of shoes you're going to have. Why? Because the Lord is going to take care of you. Watch, I'll prove it. After 40 years in the wilderness, Deuteronomy 29 and 5 says this about the Israelites. He says, I've led you 40 years in the wilderness, and your clothes have not worn out on you. He said, it wasn't even Louis. He said, he said it, wasn't, it wasn't even what you, what, what you would have bought at, at a Neiman's or, or Dillard's or, 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 or Custom. He says, but your clothes didn't wear out. Why? Because I provided them for you. He says, I want to take care of you. He says, and your sandals that you have on your feet, those red bottoms that you wanted, those still would have fell apart. But the sandals I give you, they're going to last as long as I'm taking care of you. He says, why are you so worried about your clothes? He says, you can't be so worried about these things. Watch this, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 10. This is the out scripture for me right here. He says, now 
There is great gain in godliness with contentment. Say contentment. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Paul said, I learned to be content in all things. Here it is, verse 9. But those who desire, say desire, desire. to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is not the root. I'm saying that. If you go to any tree and you dig it up, there are multiple roots. And so what we've done is we've demonized money because the Bible says that it is a root, or the love of it rather, not even money, the love of it is the root of a root of all kinds of evil. The problem is that when I have a love for money, it usually comes along with pride and greed and selfishness and all these other roots that then begin to disease the tree and produce evil in my life. But he says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving for money and it's the desire for money that some have wandered away from the faith. There's nothing wrong with you having things. It's that when things drive you away from God, therein lies the problem. That the, the, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. I need you to understand because when I was studying this, this was a tough one for me because I've been studying habits of successful people and habits of this. And I've been studying it in the Bible. I've been studying all this. And I don't want to be broke. I don't know some of the deep people don't want to hear that, but it's just the truth. And if you raise your hand and tell me, yeah, I just want to be broke, you're an ascetic. <laughs> the problem is not having riches. The problem is chasing riches because being rich is a moving target. Being rich is a moving target. The problem is not having riches, because God can bless you with them. I just told you Proverbs 10, 22, write it down. Go read it for yourself when you get home. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, but adds no sorrow to it. This, said, this text says when you crave riches by themselves without the faith, there are many pains that come with it. Here's what, he's, here's what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with having riches, but chasing riches is a problem because rich is a moving target. I know it. Here's why. Based on history, rich is a moving target. How do I know rich is a moving target based on history? Because what a million dollars would have bought you 20 years ago, it won't buy you today. So rich is a moving target. If you've seen the Austin Powers movies, you understand that Dr. Evil woke up out of a, a long sleep after decades of sleep, and here's what he says to the people of the United Nations. He says, I'm gonna hijack the world unless you give me a ransom of one million dollars. And they laughed at him. And his boys had to tell him, Dr. Evil, a million dollars is not even a lot of money anymore. Because rich is a moving target. It's a moving target based on history. It's also a moving target based on geography. Depending on where you go in the world, you take your salary from America into some third world country, you are balling. The thing that you're complaining about here, you're a king. When I went to Uganda and I had all those shillings, your boy felt like he could just move and just do his thing. Like I was tipping everybody, like here you go, here you go. <laughs> Because real, rich is a moving target based on geography. And, and there are some people who would have your money in another country and feel wealthy and come here and feel dead broke. It is, it is a moving target based on geography, Tony, even in our nation. They say if you make six figures in San Francisco, you are considered below the poverty line. Low six figures in, in, in San Francisco. Some of y'all saying, wow. Y'all like, well, I, I'll tell you where I'm not moving. <laughs> now you know why I'm here. Amen. <laughs> I got a raise just by moving. <laughs> the last thing is based on exposure. Rich is a movie target based on exposure. I heard somebody say this recently. He was like, man, what would you do if you had $120,000? And the guy looked back at him and said, is that supposed to be a lot of money? <laughs> because rich is a moving target depending on your exposure. If you've never had anything, $10,000 is a lot of money. If you had, if you had money in the bank, $100,000 may not be a lot of money. When you're hanging out with billionaires, $10 million is not a lot of money. It's based on exposure. So if you keep pursuing something that keeps moving, here's the problem. You'll chase paper forever. But if you have to chase paper, that means that paper runs, and you can't outrun paper. That's why you find yourself chasing it all the time. 
But the Bible says, and Jeremiah says, that if you seek God, you will find him if you find, when you find him with all of your heart, when you seek him, rather, with all of your heart. God says, I've been here the whole time. I have not moved. I have not gone anywhere. And if you seek me, you'll find me. And the reality is, when you seek God and you find God, not only do you get God, but you get stuck with it. Don't miss it, because that's what that's what that's where the last point is. And that's where it comes in. After we look at our a, a simple life and a simple style, you have to have a simple change, and that change is a change of mind. A simple life and a simple style leads to a simple change, and that change is a change of mind. Look at verse thirty-one. What it says it says, therefore, do not be anxious. I love this. I saw a skit one time that said there was this counselor, and this dude comes in, and uh, several times in this text you've seen, do not be anxious, do not be anxious, do not be anxious. He said the dude was giving the uh, advice to this lady. She was talking about, you know, she was paranoid and she was having issues and she was depressed and she was causing herself to have all these issues and whatever in life. And the counselor, she, he leaned back, he's nodding, and she asked for his advice. And he, he, he opens his eyes, he leans forward, he opens his mouth, and you think he's about to say something deep, he goes, Stop it! <laughs> and then you look and she's like, taken aback. She says, well, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm having all these issues, and, and I'm a procrastinator. Stop it. Well, I, well, I'm depressed. Stop it. Well, I'm this. Stop it. And his only advice to her was stop over and over and over again. And I, and I thought about that when I read this particular text, that Jesus does not give us, rather, any deep uh, theological explanations for how we get rid of anxiety. Here's what he legitimately says about your worries. Stop it. Over and over again. Do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Stop it. Stop it. Like, I'm worried, Jesus. Stop. Stop. He said, but Jesus, I'm, 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 I'm confused, Jesus. Stop. He said, it's not complicated. It's simple. You want to stop? You, you want to not be anxious anymore? Stop. I know some people are like, man, you trivializing it. You're dealing with it in a simple way. No, I need, I want you to go to counseling. We have the mental health sessions here. I want you to do that. But here's what I'm telling you. At the end of the day, it's this simple. Stop. Stop working yourself up over what somebody has that you don't have. Stop comparing yourself to what God didn't do in your life, but what he did for somebody else. Stop telling yourself what you are not and start telling yourself who you are in God. Stop claiming negative things over your life and start proclaiming the promises of God on your life. Stop watching things that make you anxious. Stop talking to people who make you anxious. Stop going to places that make you anxious. Stop it. Here's the thing. The text tells us to stop, but it does not only tell us to stop, it tells us to stop and seek. Watch. He says, therefore, do not be anxious. Stop it. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them all. He said, I'm not telling you it's a bad thing. You need all of it. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Missed it. Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Stop doing those things and start seeking him. You need to start seeking God. You need to start seeking God. Look what the text says. The text says when I stop and seek, I stop seeking things and I start seeking God. And when I start seeking God, I begin to change my focus. That's why I said it's simple change. It's stop looking at this and start looking at him. Stop looking at that and start looking at him. It's just a change of focus. I can't, uh, when I seek the kingdom first, then what I get is the kingdom results. But I can't seek the kingdom first and seek something else at the same time. Steve, I was thinking about this. You know when we watch sports, right? And there's, there's like a golf tournament on. And somebody's going to be at the leaderboard, they're going to be number one. But somebody also is tied, they got the same amount of strokes. But two people can't occupy the number one slot. So what it'll say is it'll say one, Tiger Woods, two, no, nope, it won't say two, it's even one, Tiger Woods, and then underneath his name it'll say Jordan Spieth. Then the next number is not two, it's three. You ever notice that? Because only one person can occupy the number one spot, even when they're tied. And what they're saying to you in sports, when two people occupy a tied slot, somebody's going to take this one, and one of y'all going to be two. Because we're not even going to give the next person two. They're going to be three. Because two people cannot occupy the number one spot at the same time. And what the Lord is saying, like that great theologian Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first, 
God says, that's, that's what I need you to understand about me. If I ain't first, I'm last, and I need you to get it. You can't have your career and the kingdom in the first slot. You can't have your health and the kingdom in the first slot. You can't have your family and the kingdom in the first slot. You can't have your service and the kingdom in the first slot. The kingdom has to be first, because if it ain't first, it's last. And here's what he says. If two things occupy the first spot, something is taking number two, and something is taking number one. And in our lives, most of the time, it's God who ends up in number two. When we say they're tied, they're not really tied. When we say they're tied, they're not really tied. Something's going to number two. And what we need to do is we need to seek unequivocally, unquestionably, the kingdom first. When we seek the kingdom first, it will prioritize everything in our lives above and around it. Everything in our lives will be focused above and around uh, everything else. Here, here's what happens though. When you focus on the first, he organizes and blesses the rest. That's the principle of the tithe. That's why when you bring him the first 10%, he blesses the 90. We don't get it yet. Let me show you how this works. In 1 Kings chapter number 3, Solomon decides to seek the kingdom first. Watch what happens. He, he, he's asked a question. Hey, what do you want from me, Solomon. Anything you want, you let me know. Solomon says, I want wisdom because I'm young. I don't know how to rock, rock this thing as a king. I don't know how these people are going to respond to me. My pops is a legend. I need someone. I mean, I need wisdom. I need wisdom to run this thing. And God said to him, verse 11, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or 